I am Charlie Enright, and I'm the skipper of the 11th Hour Racing Team, and we have a very special guest with us here today. I'm Nicole Stott, very happy to be here today. I'm a retired NASA astronaut, aquanaut, artist, and most importantly, a mom. People talk about when you go into space and you look back, you have this amazing feeling, and they call it the overview effect, and it's the first time you see the Earth by itself, away from you in all its glory. Like, what is, what is that like? You know, these two words, the overview effect, um, a, a dear friend now, after time getting to meet Frank White, who is the guy who coined that term, and he envisioned it like through the window of an airplane. The sensation that, that humans would have when they're separated from the planet, you know, in space, seeing Earth on its own, like you described. And I think what it brings to life in the, the best way is just wow, we live on a planet. You know, I mean, this idea, we know this when we're kids, right? But to look at it that way, like this is a planet in space and that we're all earthlings, that the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that's, you know, blanketing and protecting us all. And how everything, absolutely everything is interconnected. And I have to believe like, just like on a, a boat in the ocean, just coming to grips with the fact that by behaving like crewmates, you know, in that environment, not passengers, you know, we really do have the power to create a, a, a very positive, beautiful future for ourselves. And whether that's on a spaceship in space or on a, a planet together. The thing I think that the overview effect or this feeling of it that gets in you, it, it's just not, oh, I experienced the overview effect. And like, okay, now I can go on with my life and, um, and remember that I, I did that. But it absolutely gets in you. I think there's acknowledgement every day from that point on in one way or another. And I think it has um, the ability to really, I don't know, bring the sense of it to life in my life every day, but with the, like this motivation behind it to want to do something with it, to want to take action as a result of it, to want to let everyone know that, hey, you need to be a crew, a crew member, not a passenger, and how much better life would be for everyone here if we did that. I love this idea that you have of the ocean view effect, and I'd love to hear how those two things um, are the same, are different, the feelings you have because of them? I think it's similar in a lot of ways. Um, the ocean view effect for me um, doesn't really come into play until after, and you've had time to think about it and process mm -hmm. actually what you've just done, what you've just accomplished, what it means to be you know, in the vastness of the ocean and to be so far from land and other terrestrial beings. Yeah. And it, uh, it really does give you an appreciation for the ocean that it plays in our everyday lives. You talked about interconnectivity mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's amazing how the ocean really does feature in every single person on this planet's everyday life, whether they know it or not. Do you ever feel unsafe in space doing what you do? The, the question that comes along with that a lot is, were you scared when you yes. were in space? Yes. You know, did it frighten you? And no, I, I think I was respectful. Mm -hmm. Totally respectful of the environment I was in. I um, did my best in preparing to make sure that I'd be ready to help my crewmates if, when it's hitting the fan, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think the thing that I was afraid of was not what was happening in our spaceship, but what might, if something might happen to my family on the ground, right. you know? Yep. And then yep. I'm in a place where I can't get there. I can't be where my seven-year-old son is, maybe something happening to him. You know, we're very lucky to do what we do, for sure. Um, but the toll that it takes on the family life is a, is a serious one. And, um, you know, I found myself in a situation uh, in a leg from Cape Town, South Africa to Melbourne, Australia, where my son actually ended up in the hospital in the ICU. And I oh, was wow. days from even getting to a place where I could do something about it. And um, it was a difficult time for me personally, very difficult time for my family. And there were some questions about, do you continue down this right. career path for sure? <laughs> you're, you're always scared of what you can't control. And I think that's it. And when you're on exactly the boat it. and you have control <laughs> exactly of your situation, it. no matter how scary yeah. or hairy or whatever you want to say it is, at least you're in control. Um, and what you leave behind is that that becomes the unknown. What's been your biggest challenge in space? Never, never was challenged. Really? No. <laughs> you know, and in some ways, I think the, bi the biggest challenge was training, preparing to go to space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the time in space was uh, 
I don't know, when I, look, when I think back on it, less challenging than what, you know, what had to go, what had to be invested into the training. Just like, it's like and college. The, like yeah, the, yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I mean, I think about things like our, um, this Aquarius mission we did, this undersea mission oh, yeah. that was in preparation for going to space. So live in in this school bus size habitat, you know, on the ocean floor for 18 days, preparing to, you know, for what it would be like to live and work um, on a space station. And, and even that, the, that Aquarius mission itself was amazing. I mean, the, clo the best analog to living mm. in space you can find. And we kind of joke that, oh, you get to go live in inner space to learn how to live and work in outer space. And it's awesome. But for me, to be able to do that Aquarius mission, I really and truly had to overcome like one of my greatest fears, which was drowning. Okay. <laughs> and you know, because to do it, we had to, you had to do some pretty advanced scuba skill stuff and the swimming thing we talked about, you had to, okay. you know, swim in ways that I, I mean, I grew up in Florida, wiki watchy swimming. I never did the swim team thing or any of that. And I'm not a free diver. And, um, while I had my scuba certification, I really and truly considered myself a recreational diver. Yeah. You know, I didn't want anybody touching my mask or taking my regulator out mm -hmm. of my mouth mm -hmm. or, you know, any of that stuff. And in order to be able to ultimately go to space, I had to do this undersea thing, which required me to really just mentally, physically overcome things that I didn't think I could. Um, which meant that if I knew I had to swim, you know, for the swim test, um, however many, you know, whatever distance in the certain period of time, I had to get out. I knew I had to go out and do at least double that so that I'd be okay when I did that test. Mentally. Mentally, yeah. yeah. Or if I was going to have to do all these, these scuba skill things where... I'd be doing line searches without a mask on and you know somebody's taking my regulator from me or be it, you know flooding one of these big helmet you know mm -hmm. scoop dive things that I was going to have to get somebody to help me overcome that in a pool somewhere else before going to that place. And man, that was I think in the grand scheme of all of it was probably the most challenging thing I had to do to be able to fly in space. Why, how, why did you decide to become an ocean racer? It's all I've ever known and all I've ever really wanted to do. I mean, I grew up in Rhode Island, uh, which is, you know, a maritime epicenter, you know, where it's easy to have dreams mm -hmm. like that. You know, there's other mediums of sailing, you know, as you just yeah, pointed yeah. out. Um, but this is certainly the most, in my opinion, rugged, um, the most adventurous, um, in many ways, the most challenging. Um, you know, because in and above the competition, you have this uh, circumnavigation, planetary obligation, whatever you want to call it. It's, um, it's, an, it's an added narrative, you know, uh, people race you know, in and around Rhode Island Sound, and that's one way to do it, the America's Cup, sleep mm -hmm. in your own bed every night. Um, but this race <laughs> has always appealed to me because of the challenge yeah. that it represents and, you know, my own personal tie to the ocean, um, not like the pond, not the lake, not the bay, um, but the ocean, you know, yeah. and um, yeah, and, 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 and the global nature of it all. Why did you become an astronaut? You know, whenever I get that question, it usually is followed by, um, did you always want to be one? You know, did you grow up wanting to be one? I, I, um, I, it makes me really happy to discover, like with you, that this was just, this was something that was like part of your life always. Like it just kept building on itself too. And, you know, and the challenge of it kept getting greater. I mean, to circumnavigate, that's you know, not an insignificant thing to yeah. do. And then to be doing it as a, a race too, that's, you know, in competition, you're just not leisurely doing it either. I mean, in the end, I wanted to become an astronaut because I was really excited about the work that NASA is doing in space. There wasn't any, oh, you'll make the greatest astronaut there ever was, you know, Prove although it. they might yeah, say that yeah, now, yeah. but they didn't discourage me either. You know, no. there was no discouragement. It was like they were just giving me a test. The, the power, a test, the power to do the one thing in the whole process that I had control of, which was to apply. Huh. And I am so thankful to them. 
And yes, the adventure side of it is, I highly recommend it. But I also really highly recommend the work that we're doing there. That's, that's so beautifully motivated by improving life on Earth. And it's what I love about what you're doing too. Because this circumnavigation of the ocean, it's, it's raising awareness of the ocean in a way that people might not otherwise consider, which is a huge thing to have happening. Because I'm just really learning more and more about what 11th hour racing is all about and have been so excited to learn more and um, excited by the very positive nature of what goes on beyond the race itself. And so can you tell us, tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, our, our, our mission, as you might say, um, you know, it's twofold. It's to, um, you know, win offshore sailboat races, mm -hmm. in this case, around the world, um, and to use that platform to communicate about the importance of ocean health. And, um, you know, sometimes it's done through awareness and communication and working with grantees in different parts of the world and drawing attention to it. But, um, in other situations, it's it's more hands-on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're on the boat visiting remote locations that no one else goes to, gets to see, and we're collecting data, um, you know, for climate models, um, for weather models, um, you know, that we're reliant upon and the rest of the world is reliant upon to get a handle on some of these problems that, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people either don't know exist <laughs> or don't know enough to know that they should know it exists. Right. Um, and and the, just the interconnectivity of the ocean that we see every day um, with people living these normal terrestrial lives that don't necessarily have an appreciation for it or the importance of it in their own own lives. So that's it's it's a big mission, certainly. Um, but it starts with credibility, um, you know, in, in the races that we're engaged in. Um, but the importance of the messaging and the importance of ocean health makes that part of our job so much more rewarding. The, the bulk of our planet is ocean, right? Yep. <laughs> I think we just know that. It's kind of like knowing we live on a planet. Yep. We know it, but do we really um, kind of keep it in our minds in any way? And reflect on the significance of it. And I think that platforms like 11th Hour Racing are, there's a creativity to it too. There's certainly, a, as far as I can tell, a real, like a real passion for it. Um, beyond the race, um, there's, I, I can't imagine you wanna be racing through an ocean that's dead. It, you know, there's, there's no, I mean, <laughs> be something very different to that. So there's, there's, a, there's a motivation in it that's, um, that's bigger than just the race. It's, uh, it's like just planetary health in general. I mean, in some ways we're the kind of canary in the coal mine because we're out there seeing things in places that other people don't go that, you know, verify or point out or illustrate, you know, some problems that are over the horizon for most people. Right. You know, if you live in the middle of Kansas, I mean, do you know that every second breath you take is because of the ocean? Probably not. And even if you know the saying that goes along those lines, yeah. um, do you know what that means practically? <laughs> right. Why it's important right. um, that we protect it or, you know, there's not going to be the vibrant future that we all want. And I have to imagine as you're as you're racing through the water that that there's the that there's a sense of more than what's just on the surface too. We we always talk about the ability to um, see things that other people don't get to see, um, but there are so many things happening in and around the ocean or beneath the surface that you know we know so little about, <laughs> yeah. and that we're striving to find out more because the answer, you know, who knows, to some of these issues could, could, could be out there for us, and we yeah. just haven't gotten there yet. When you look out the window of the space station, what's the first thing you feel? Gratitude. <laughs> and I think because, first of all, that I, just this, like, wow, I'm in this place. Just thankful to have the opportunity to be floating in this place and, you know, looking out the window at a planet that's our home. Um, in some ways, feeling more connected to it from that place than I had with my feet on the ground. Grateful to the point where I feel like an obligation to want to share that, to want people to feel what I felt looking out that window. And then hopefully they'll want to behave like crewmates 
not passengers. What was the most lasting impression from your time in space? We go to space and it's um, just to get out of this hold that gravity has on us or <laughs> to live and work there, you know, to survive there for a short period of time and then get home safely. It's a really complex thing to do. There's like complexity in, in all of it. Even the relationships between the partners that are, are playing in, in all of it as well. Um, but uh, for me, it was this, the, the lasting impression is really the, the simple stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I always boil it down to these, these three simple lessons of, oh my gosh, we live on a planet. You know, you'd think I would have known that before flying in space. Um, all earthlings, only border that matters, that thin blue line of atmosphere. By behaving like crewmates, not passengers, you know, that we have the power to create a future for all life on Earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. And, and I carry that with me every day now. There's not a day goes by where I'm not thinking, planet earthling, thin blue line, okay, be a crewmate, Nikki. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to, to share it through my actions and, um, and the way I, hopefully the way I treat people and encourage others to, to latch on to that as well without having to go to space and to appreciate. I think it's, it, it really came from this appreciation of the awe and wonder that was surrounding me in that place and um, just taking that in and wanting to take action as a result of it. So for me, the lasting impression is probably perspective, just an appreciation uh, for what we're doing, what we're surrounded by, the ocean, you know, in all its glory, um, the minimalism that we're able to live with. Oh my gosh, um, yes. <laughs> when, when there's a demand for it, um, just what we need to survive versus what we think we need to survive and what we want on a daily basis. The life that you lead at sea has like so many different ramifications for how you live your everyday life as a member of mm -hmm. this convoluted society that we've <laughs> created. And um, I think it just gives you really good perspective just on, on, on what's really important. Wow, I should be looking at things a little bit differently. And what you said about like what we need. I mean, I had one pair of pants for three months on the space station. Yeah. Amazing how, how that was just fine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and to think about the way, I don't know, the parallel again, and I, you know, your boat to me is this, it's like our Capsule. spaceship. You're, it's, it's, you know, this is your life support system, right? And um, figuring out how to take advantage of the resources that you have available to you to survive and perhaps even thrive in that place. And I mean, I look at the space station, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, we do all of this work to allow ourselves to live safely on a space station, this mechanical life support system that we build in space to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally, right? And we do it really well there as a crew. You know, every day we're paying attention to how much CO2 is in our atmosphere and how much clean drinking water we have and the integrity of our thin metal hull and the health and well-being of all our crewmates. And we do that because we know we have to do it to survive there. And it's exactly the same kind of thing that I have to believe in one way or another. It's different things maybe that you're looking at, but that's what's happening on your boat, right? Oh, for sure. And why can't we do that on our like planetary spaceship? And I think that things like 11th hour racing, I think things like what we're doing in space where, you know, from that platform, you know, you talked about what you're measuring, how you're being mm -hmm. part of the solution even, raising the awareness of the issues that are out there that need to be solved. And in space, we're doing that same thing. You know, we're measuring the vital signs of our planet from space so that we can put that together with the data you're getting and actually solve the problems. You know, we're, we're as the human beings there, we're the guinea pigs of the science <laughs> that's going on there not just to figure out how we can live further off our planet, but to bring those solutions back here to Earth. And in every aspect of what we're doing there, that's happening. And, and I, I think in, in one way or another, the same thing is happening on oh, your boat as you're crew, racing across the ocean. Biometrics, yeah. drinking water, <laughs> the structural integrity of yeah. the hull. I mean, the parallels are 
absolutely infinite. Yeah. And I mean, what we're doing is we're monitoring to make sure there's no degradation. You know, we wouldn't accept degradation in the environments that we live and work in. If yeah. anything, we're trying to, you know, preserve them and leave them in a better state than we found them because it's all yeah. we got. So you might find this funny, but, um, you know, we often describe our cockpit where we do our work as sailors sailing around the world as our capsule. Mm -hmm. And um, it's protected from the elements. Uh, but whenever we have to go out and do something, whether it's change a sail, reduce sail, we call it putting in a reef, um, we call that spacewalking because it's awesome. our version <laughs> of going outside the capsule and um, you know experiencing the elements. And we have to put on all the gear and do all the stuff. And it's just a funny, just a funny parallel. Which actually to me seems so much scarier yeah. <laughs> than doing a spacewalk in space. I, I don't know if it's the same on the boat, but probably the surrealist of all the, what I would call surreal being in space just in general, but man, to put on your own little spaceship and Mm -hmm. go out and crawl around the outside of your bigger ship. I'm sure, I, I have to believe it's the same on the boat where the people that are still in the capsule can hear the person that's out there. They're trying to monitor them, make sure they're, they're safe while that's going Correct. on. Same things happen yep. yep. on our spaceship. Takes a little time to get ready to go out. That was the place where I felt like I was the most alone, but at the same time, the most like, connected to my crew. Because I, I mean, I knew I was in my own little spaceship, and I'm out there. And I have your to, life you know, tether in not, yeah. their hands. But then, um, but I wasn't alone. I mean, they were there as much as they possibly could to make sure that I was okay. I think I, I'm envisioning somebody up at the top of a sail, yeah, <laughs> having climbed all the way up, you know, to a top, the top of a sail, and that. That to me is probably the parallel to riding on the end of the robotic arm on the space station, where you become the furthest person from everybody else you're up there with, and you're just, you are alone in that place. And, and yet there was like a peaceful nature to it too that I didn't necessarily expect not the most peaceful place, for, for us. You guys, I know. And I describe um, gravity in that situation as being omnipresent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Unlike. The, yeah. 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 <laughs> the, the the boat can be a little bit wild in the sea state. Yeah. And um, you're always coming back down to earth, um, for sure. Mm -hmm. The boats foil, so they they fly in their own little yeah. way. And um, we, sometimes when we come off the foil, we call it coming out of orbit. And you come back down yeah. and you touch the ocean and... Um, Gently, I'm sure. You feel it, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Not the most comfortable sensation there is. Whereas in space, we're not worried about falling, but we are worried about disconnecting. Mm -hmm. Like, not having the tether properly in place. And That's a the, man overboard. The diligence that you have to go into for that. Person overboard situation yeah. for us. And how is racing and what you're doing, why do you feel this need to use it as a platform? I'm very passionate um, about the ocean and about ocean health and very lucky that I get to mix my passion with my profession. And I think we're very fortunate to have a voice in this conversation and um, an obligation really um, to use our platform for change. I mean, we talked a little bit before about, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are people out there that don't know that the ocean is under threat and what importance um, that has to everyday life. And um, you know, for some people, it's easy to blow off because um, maybe they don't see the consequences of the situation as something they are going to have to deal with. Um, you talked about being a mother. Uh, I'm a father of two. And I know that if we don't change and do something mm -hmm. about it and use our respective platforms to draw attention to and to create solutions for what's going on, then the next generation of inhabitants of Earthlings mm -hmm. are going to be the ones that, um, that, that, that really suffer the consequences. So the time to act on all this is right now. Um, and I think you understand that, I understand that, and the more we can help everybody else understand that, um, the better collective position we'll be in. It, I mean, it really points out this, uh, the interconnectivity, I think, is a word that's come up quite a few mm -hmm. times. Um, and just some of these common underlying, like, motivations and experiences through 
something like being at sea and being in space. Using that as a platform, I think, is, is a really important thing to do. Um, just like you said, how there are some people don't realize um, how critical the ocean's health, that planetary health, is to our personal health. And, um, and wanting to make them <laughs> mm -hmm. feel that, understand that, and know how they can make changes in their own lives to, um, to make it better. It just kills me that there are people who don't know there's an International Space Station. And this place that has been orbiting our planet for over 20 years now, with the best example of international partnership I think you can find anywhere, 15 different countries working peacefully and successfully with this, I will just say it, greater good mission, you know, for over 20 years, all for the benefit of life on Earth. And that's a pretty incredible thing. I, you know, I pinch myself that I got to be part of that, which then I think, just like your experience, it, I mean, it really kind of resonates in a way that makes you want to be part of the solution and to encourage others to be part of the solution as well. And every day we are using things, you on your boat, using things that are coming to us from space that allow us to navigate or communicate or measure what's mm -hmm. happening to the planet so that we can solve those problems or be more healthy um, to, um, to treat the planet better just through the ways we're living and working and studying the things we are in space. And I feel like that's an important thing for people to know and to be part of. And I'm really, really happy that, that you and 11th Hour Racing are bringing that. I kind of look at it like bringing it back to Earth and then <laughs> spreading it around the Earth and you know, just really, so people can, I mean, this who and where we are in space together comes to light through experiences like you're having and the way that you can creatively share them mm -hmm. for the benefit of, of the kids, of the children, of, you know, of us being parents and, and wanting um, life for our kids to be better. And I think, um, I think we've just been blessed to be in places that are certainly special vantage points on all of it. And, um, and I'm thankful that you're wanting to share it as well.